I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering, and this is The Uncommon Engineer. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. System biology, predictive medicine, and a lot of computational biology. Doctors like this are the link between the research laboratory and the people. Better diagnoses, earlier interventions, more efficient drug therapies, and customized treatment plans. These are the promises of predictive medicine. By understanding a patient's unique genome, doctors are creating more effective treatments. In fact, your own stem cells could be the main ingredient for a cure. Welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Engineer podcast. I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering. The Uncommon Engineer discusses how Georgia Tech engineers make a difference in our world, in our daily lives, and in ways you might not expect. Our guest today is Dr. Manu Plot. He's a professor in the Coulter School of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech in Emory. He's going to talk to us today about his work in medicine and healthcare, specifically breast cancer and sickle cell, and how predictive medicine fits into the diseases we face. Welcome to the program, Manu. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, let's let's jump right in. Can you say a little bit about what's happening in your lab these days? Certainly. We've got so many exciting projects going on, at least I think so. Hopefully I can convince the audience. Um, a major focus we're looking at right now is breast cancer. We really think about that quite a bit. And if two women have breast cancer, how come one person is more aggressive than the others? So we can give her and her doctor a little bit more information to decide on how radical the treatment should be for that person. Um, and that's been a great thing. It brings into play system biology, predictive medicine, and a lot of computational biology that brings engineering and biology together. Um, we also do a lot of things uh, working with our colleagues over at Emory University. As you know, I'm in the joint BME department and uh, work with my good buddy Mike Davis over there. We've been doing some really interesting work in how if you can take these cardiac progenitor cells or these stem cells from children that have undergone surgery to repair like defects, that we can isolate these cells, that they produce these amazing factors that we can then use on an adult heart to help that heart repair. Hair. So that's the biology part of the work. And then I'm helping them look at, again, through computational modeling, what are some of the really interesting signals that are present in those uh, little things that they're releasing that then we can then make a drug or make a combination that doesn't require us ultimately to use the stem cells from the, the pediatric hearts. Um, other things that are going on, sickle cell takes over my lab. It is a terrible disease that is still um, shortening life expectancy. Really high rate of people here in Georgia. Um, and as you know, it predominantly affects African Americans in the United States. Um, and so we really care about why children with sickle cell disease are at risk of strokes. Because when I was getting my PhD here a long, long, long time ago, uh, we were looking at adults getting strokes, and these are people 67 years old, but in sickle cell, this genetic disease, then children um, having strokes at the ages of two through five years old, which lots of mechanisms that still need to be determined, and we use a great group using fluid dynamics, cell biology, and all these wonderful tools we learn here in biomedical engineering to address that problem. You start a little bit about um, whether it's breast cancer for women, whether it's stem cells, um, and other things you talked about. What uh, what are some of the common threads uh, right. that, that so, you work on? 
My lab, we're the Platt Lab for repair, regeneration, and remodeling. And really, it's about tissue remodeling. So we really look at these enzymes that help change a tissue from its healthy tissue to its disease state. So how can we stop that? Um, that's the first way. And then, of course, for the regeneration, we're looking at the opposite way. How do you go from that disease tissue to that healthy state? And we study these enzymes that actually do that remodeling. Now, the trick about these enzymes are kind of tricky. Enzymes have temporal natures. They're dynamic. And that's where all the computation analysis is extremely helpful in helping us understand the dynamics that are changing that you can't test every step experimentally. So you fill in that gaps using the computational math. Before we go into uh, details, can you say what is predictive medicine for those that uh, for our listeners that don't? Uh... When I try to explain it to others, what I what I think about is again is how do you see in the future what's going to happen for one person versus another person because we are all individuals and so the clinicians actually have to deal with the end of one which in scientific research we do the whole population so what happens for this particular person i want my clinician to think about me directly so that is then taking particular markers or measures from me my physiology how i would respond of drugs that are on the market they work for 80 percent of the population 20 percent they just don't work it's not really clear why. They just don't work for 20%. And that 20% could be different for drug A than drug B than drug B than drug C. So predictive medicine is not taking the risk of let's do the populations, but let's sample you and find out what will exactly work for your course of treatment. And that, I think, should make the patient feel special. But then again, the other problem is, as we mentioned earlier, or as we mentioned, how do you predict the future? And as I always tell my students, I work with a breast cancer doctor, and I say, if I go in and ask him, hey, so can you just not treat this patient? We see what happens, see if I'm right. If he says yes, run, <laughs> right? Luckily, he doesn't say yes. He says, wait, stop. So they still treat the patient as best as possible, and then we try to predict the outcome along the way. Each of us have a different proteolytic potential, we call it, where even in a non-disease state, there's just something inherent about our genes, as we mentioned, um, something about the way we activate certain um, pathways, and that's where that personalized medicine comes into play. Something about you makes your cells be super active when they see this, this stimuli, and mine might be very different. But then if we got that breast cancer as a stimulus, how would our cells react to that case is what we're trying to predict. So that when that woman goes to the doctor, the doctor can say, listen, we've done this test. Looks like you have the more invasive phenotype. Maybe we should go for the more aggressive treatment. Or, or alternatively, say to another woman, like, we think we can keep a close watch on this and do something like local radiation. If you're interested in doing that, we can work with you. If you're not, you want the double mastectomy, we can do that also. Mm -hmm. But the trick about personalized medicine treatment is that's one part of the tricky. But then we take that for predictive medicine and engineers are good, but we still can't really see the future yet. <laughs> OK, you know, back to the future hasn't quite happened yet. So how do you test predictive medicine as what? seeing the future. And so working with a clinician here um, at DeKalb Medical Center in Atlanta, he would give us samples from his women undergoing do double mastectomies. And by the way, he's a Georgia Tech alum. That's mm. how we met. Mm. Um, and then we were testing our predictions with what were these women's initial diagnoses when they were diagnosed with cancer. And we actually did find a nice relationship. I know that your lab um, is is large. You have a lot of students, and so and because we talk about computation, we've been talking about enzymes, we talk about biology, we talk about cancer. My guess is the skill set of the students in your labs, and maybe even the director of the lab, you know, has a really uh, talk about the kinds of skills that are that are needed to be successful. And because you know, you're you're coming at so many of these problems holistically and from so many different angles, I mean, wow, how to what does it take to be in your lab? Well, <laughs> curiosity, I think curiosity first, um, curiosity and teamwork. Uh, my lab is pretty sizable, I'd say, yes. And it's also a really diverse lab. So that's why we can do so many projects. It's diverse in the people, their backgrounds, but also in their interests. So I have some people who are interested in really doing computational biology, right? So, and there's some great Georgia Tech undergrads that have been working with us to do some of that work um, because we have some great coursework. And again, engineers are really computationally minded. 
Then I've got those that want to do more of the biology side. Um, so we do run a good wet lab, and we do work on the cellular level. But we also do preclinical models. Then I have students that are medically oriented, um, that are interested in becoming medical doctors. So I have collaborators that are clinicians, and those students tend to um, favor those projects. And so it's about um, letting people that are interested in the lab know all the different projects, what you might be interacting with if you are part of a project, and then kind of letting them sample the space a bit to find their niche. And then, of course, my part is kind of the grand puppeteer of all of it and um, and just really loving the different projects that we're studying. Because, what again, the thing that drives me and I hope drives my students is these are real problems that we want to solve for people. So it's not just an academic gesture, right? And by interacting, we also interact with the communities at which these problems um address. So I also like people in my lab who care about doing the community outreach, working with the uh, community-based organization, because I think that makes the problems real, hopefully motivating longer time in lab. Well, I mean, I can, um, I think like a lot of people can relate to the need, the really critical need. There's a lot of patients out there, say, for, with sickle cell disease that are, are, um, that, that are in need today right now for new and advanced therapies and so i'm i'm really curious about how close you get to those patients you talked about you know reaching out to to communities but you know with our partnership with emory uh the hospitals right nearby you know georgia tech doesn't have a hospital but emory does and i'm really curious about um how you connect to patients and how um because there are there are there are too many patients today that need the work that you're doing. So can you talk about uh, how that fits into your research program? It's interesting. Again, I never, well, I did used to think that I wanted to be a doctor, but dealing with patients for me is just too much stress. And it's, I'm a very emotional person, so I really can't deal. But um, I find talking to the patients, number one, gives you insight on what they're actually feeling and what they're actually going through. So you mentioned we do have that partnership with Emory. So we work really closely with Emory's Department of Pediatrics and particularly their Pediatric Hematology Oncology Group, where there are several um, excellent researchers there and also clinicians clinicians that work on sickle cell disease as a problem. Um, so that's been great to find out because, again, as an engineer, you can come up with something, but if the clinician says there are barriers to getting it to the patient, then we have to kind of retool our design. Don't so, even start, right? I mean, <laughs> right to, to go down that path because you're not going down the right path. And it's shocking when you're like, this is clearly what we would identify as the key problem. And they're like, yeah, you can solve that, but we'll never be able to do that in patients. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay. Um, and then the other way that I access patients, particularly with sickle cell, is I work with the Sickle Cell Foundation of Georgia. And um, we've been doing that actually since I started, where first we were actually, um, they would gather donors who would donate blood for some of our different projects. We got all of our approvals here through Georgia Tech IRB. Um, and it was important to actually start to pay the, the donors because a lot of people in sickle cell are on disability because they have these pain crises that prevent them from working. And... And so that was a relationship we established early on where we would pay the foundation, plus we would pay the donors. And then we just started to be involved in multiple of their fundraising activities because, you know, I started in 2009, the economy took one of its tumbles and their budget was cut. And so we pay a part. They have an annual sickle cell walk run. So I've been having large Georgia Tech teams, not only my lab, I recruit other undergrads, other faculty, staff. We raise money. We try to have the largest team ever. Um, and then we partner with them and some of their other things where they go to the Capitol. They have a sickle cell day at the Capitol where they uh, petition our state representatives. And it's always great. They kind of have this thing of, oh, Mana, we need the professor from Georgia Tech to talk to the state reps, which I'm just a person. I feel like they have all the information and they have all the insight, but it's nice that we could bring whatever gravitas being a Georgia Tech professor um, brings to that. And I, again, always like to bring my grad students and undergrads to those events because they need to see what is the other face of this. And these things are real and there are real people and, and that help like is needed now. It's needed now, and that's yeah. really critical. Not five years from now, not exactly. 10 years from now. Yeah. 
So one of the things that you talked about, um, we've had a chance to work on just a little bit and I'm, uh, around Project Engages. Sure. So completely changing the topic a little bit. And you talked about reaching out to the to the community. Um, and so can you talk about uh, Project Engages and and what's what's happening now and what, 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 where do we hope it'll go? Oh, love to talk about Project Engages. Um, Engages stands for Engaging the Next Generation at Georgia Tech in Engineering and Science. Uh, it's a partnership with the Atlanta Public School System, where we right now have six partner schools. I think we're taking another one on this year. But really where we bring in juniors and seniors from Atlanta Public Schools who come and work in the Georgia Tech labs. We started off just in the bioengineering lab space, but we've blossomed out to mechanical, electrical, aerospace, biology chemistry. Um, and so we now, I think, on campus have about 30 students. They're also summer working in GTRI labs, so doing that really applied work. And I think one of the novel aspects is that we actually pay these students. And we pay them greater than $10 an hour because... Um, you know, APS schools, the schools that we work with are Title I schools. So, you know, most of them are off free lunch, which is an indicator of socioeconomic status. And so we don't we didn't want to select for students who were just able to just intern or work for free and who would not have to work. So we pay them a good wage so they don't have to do fast food or retail or anything else. You know, I worked at Hardee's when I was in high school, which I still love Hardee's food. But I was there when they did fried chicken. So that's a whole other story. But um, no. So most of these schools, these students are African-American. American students coming here. Many, I used to think that many were just first generation college students, which most of them are. But in talking to the principals, we now know that actually some of them are first generation high school graduates, right? And so you look at what does that do for that family when their student is coming to Georgia Tech working at cutting edge research. We don't give them cookie cutter projects. Like they are working with a graduate student, they're working with a postdoc, they're working with a principal scientist at GTRI, and they are solving a new problem. And as we've progressed, we're now in year six. What's been great about it, we have actually now touched, there's been 100 students that have come through the program in these six years. And uh, in May, we actually had our first college graduates. Um, so out of the first five, we had three of them that finished in May, two more finished in December. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> because we also realized as we were going on, it wasn't just about giving them these experiences so they could get into college. The, the, the motive had to change and, okay, just getting to college is one step. Now we need to give them the skills so they will graduate from college, right? So that becomes a different level of preparation at the door. Um, and it's been great. And what I love about it more than anything, not only someone poured into me when I was in high school and had science programs for me, which I am appreciative of those professors who had those programs because now I know the work, but it also for me changes the face of science at Georgia Tech. Um, where there's all these brown faces just in all of our biotech buildings that they're comfortable, they're hanging out in the lounge, they're in the labs, they're in their lab coats, they're using our core facilities. And it's just, this is what science looks like, right? And so I, then I think it impacts the other students who are just around, the other grad students who are, oh, well, this is just what Georgia Tech scientists and engineers look like. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing. I, I remember we also do professional development for the students. And one of my uh, good friends was in town visiting. He started off as an economist working for a congressional budget office, but he started a blog that became a thing, sold the blog. And so we always want them to speak to the students to give them inspiration of different career ideas. And he was waiting for me because he arrived way earlier than he should have. And I said, well, what building are you in? He said, I'm in the one in the lobby where there's like all the black kids walking around, <laughs> or all the black people walking around. <laughs> well, tell me the building because, and he was there, and that's what he thought that the the buildings look like here. And so I love that because then when their parents come on campus and their uncles and aunts and their grandparents come for our big events, everybody feels like they belong here. And I think that's what I've always loved about Georgia Tech. Well, and I think the, um, you know, Atlanta, uh, Georgia Tech's in Atlanta, right. and there are so many of those students who, for whatever reasons, you highlighted many of them, socioeconomic, familial reasons, that they really don't have access to places like Georgia Tech. And Project Engage is, is, is that access point. I think that's, that's uh, absolutely remarkable. I think the second thing 
Um, the second thing to highlight is is that I, I've I've seen the projects that the students do, <laughs> and it's not busy work. Right, right. The students are are really accomplishing ba uh, basic science, and so I think it's a reminder to us that all high school students when tapped into, have that ability and skills right at that moment. It doesn't yeah. mean they have to get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD before they can come into our labs and be productive. And um, But they have the skills today. Um, and so I'm curious about that experience. You know, what, what do you do to tap into the fact that they don't have bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and so on? What how is it that you can tap into and really spark and ignite that success in a high school junior or senior? Yeah, that, that's uh, right. That is a really, <laughs> we, it's evolved over time. Um, and it's been an interesting part. That is how we are able to recruit new labs to it, right? So that becomes the hurdle of convincing a professor and a graduate student. If we bring in this high school student, they will be able to contribute. And so one of the first things that I like to remind them is there's always a fresh perspective that they would bring to the problem. So I think well, those of us that have been studying fields for years and for decades or however long get entrenched in the dogma behind the field and this thing can never work like this because we've known and how we've learned. And, and someone coming in with a fresh perspective could have just an insight that would never pop into the mind of someone that's entrenched in the dogma. Um, and so I find that very useful, even what I've seen in my own lab, the questions that they may ask at a lab meeting or at a journal club, that you see the whole room turn and be like, oh, like, that does seem a simpler way to go about it. But what also comes about from that is we, um, we train the mentors really well. So we do a mentor orientation and a training, and it's now become a full-day retreat because with um, the great evaluation we've done on the program just to make sure we're improving it, which has been great with Seismic has been helping us to the evaluation, um, is we realize that the graduate student and the postdoc mentors are really the critical point to the program. They are the ones who interface with the students every day. Um, and as you know, they, not only do the students work during the summer, they work during the academic school year. So they leave school early, come over here and work. So our grad students are working with them every day. And grad students are under certain pressures on their mm -hmm. own. And faculty are putting certain pressures on them. And so we realized they were kind of in this sandwich space of critical for the student success. And so in our orientation, what we we stress to them are those things that you said there these students I always tell them what's the difference between a freshman at Georgia Tech and a high school senior it's just a little bit of time right and then the other reminder is everyone all of us in that lab all of us had our first lab experience right so you can have all this book learning but that first time you're in lab <clears throat> Things are different. And so I said, that's just how they are. Um, but we actually prepare them with, a, we do a boot camp before they enter a lab. So we do a summer biotech um, and engineering boot camp where we like run them through the paces for two weeks, hardcore. And the students get a gray hair too. Okay, they don't, they're still <laughs> young. Um, but we give them the basics so that when we turn them over to the lab, the mentor doesn't have a... Uh, it's not just a complete, what do they know? So we let them know they have these basic skills. Now you can take them from there. And it really becomes about trust. It's about establishing a close mentor-mentee bond. If you trust this student, and again, trust, I think discipline is a part of trust because we do remind them this is employment for the students, but also for the grad students, these people are capable, have expectations, hold the bar up, and let them reach it. And what we've seen over this time period, we've had our engagers to just be co-authors on publications. I mean, I think at least, now I think we're up to about seven students who've co-authored like primary awesome. research publications before they start college. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're watching now to watch how many then enter into undergraduate labs when they've started their college career because they've got a resume that says, I've been doing this for a year or two. I've got a leg up. So I think it's just that trust, that openness, and being open to this diversity of ideas and respecting that they are full contributors to the science as well. Where we always end, Manu, is asking the same question of all of our guests. What makes you an uncommon engineer? <laughs> well, I've never met another engineer like me. <laughs> <laughs> what makes me uncommon? I think what we do, again, um, 
we think about solving problems that affect real people. And we think about doing it with a diverse team, with diverse ideas, and working in diverse continents. <laughs> um, and I've never met a problem that had a human component that we were scared to think about. And I love that we're raising a team of people that are like that as well. And I, and I think another thing that makes us uncommon is we value education and outreach and bringing new people into engineering, not as just charity work, but as a way to solve these problems. And I think we couldn't do it without the team that, we, that we've gathered. That's so fantastic because you know, one of the things I kept saying over and over again, there's real people and there's real patients that need it today. And I think the public needs to know that there are people like you that are not just uh, sitting in their ivory tower, you know, with their elbow patches, um, that there are plenty of us out there um, working with the community, working on real problems for people that need those solutions today. So we're really lucky to have you here today, and we're really lucky to have you at Georgia Tech. Thanks, Manu. Thanks a lot. For now, that's all for The Uncommon Engineer. I'm Steve McLaughlin. Thanks for listening.